Hello everybody, my name is Tensor. Welcome to my introduction to Flutter series. The main objective of this tutorial series is to help interested parties learn the Flutter SDK from front to back. We will look at the framework from a high level point of view and then slowly dig into the lower level concepts as we go. I will be making a few assumptions about the audience for this series. I am assuming that you are interested in Flutter in some way. It may be that you are skeptical of the framework, or it's possible that you're excited to get started with the framework. My hope is that by the end of this series, you will all be excited to use this technology for your own applications. I'm also going to be assuming that you have some understanding of programming and that you should have a fairly basic understanding of object-oriented programming. It is recommended that you know about classes and objects, as well as basic class-based inheritance. You do not need to know the Dart programming language, however, nor do you need to be an expert developer. Should you want to learn more about any of these topics, I do have some information about the Dart programming language along with object-oriented programming on my channel, and you can also find many other basic tutorials on the internet which will get you up to speed on these topics. In this first video, we will be diving right into the framework by looking at and expanding the default counterexample project that gets generated when you create a new Flutter project. This application is a good choice for a first Flutter application because it has a very small amount of state inside of it. As a reference, the word state refers to an application's data as it changes in response to events. These events could be any external or internal event that changes the data. I'll be using this word quite frequently throughout this series, so it's important that you understand what it is that I'm referring to. If we look at this counter application, which I've pulled up onto the screen, the application state of this counter application is just a single integer value. It changes when the button down here is pushed by the user, and that's really it. And since this application is very predictable, it's easy for us to reason about the building blocks of the application namely the widgets that we use to make up this Flutter application. Now before we move any further into the concepts of the Flutter framework, I want to direct you all to this website, flutter.dev. Here you will find instructions on how to download and install the Flutter SDK. So if you just go to the top right hand corner here and click get started, you'll find all of the instructions that you need based on the operating system that you're using. The SDK or the Software Development Kit also includes a version of the Dart SDK, and so it's unnecessary for you to install the standalone Dart SDK unless you wish to develop non-Flutter Dart applications. Now after you've followed these instructions, you can click this Set Up an Editor link, and this will allow you to set up and configure your IDE or text editor to work with Flutter. There are three primary choices that feature first-party Flutter support. Those would be Android Studio or IntelliJ or Visual Studio Code. For this series, I personally will be using VS Code because it's the tool that I'm most comfortable with, but because Flutter's tooling is fairly uniform across all of these editors, you're free to use whichever you want. And you can just go ahead and follow the instructions here just like you did when you installed the Flutter SDK. I will also be using an Android emulator, specifically this one, which is called AVD or Android Virtual Device, which comes with the Android SDK. You're free to use whichever emulator, simulator, or physical device that you have access to. If you're on Windows, I recommend that you use AVD or another emulator called Gany Motion. If you can't use either, then you can always just plug in a physical Android or iOS device. Just keep in mind that some of the application behavior may change depending on which platform you're using, Android or iOS. Though this is something that we can change through the tooling. Now before we get into the code, I want to talk briefly about Flutter's developer pipeline. As you're following along with this series, you'll probably notice that if you make a change, when you save, the change will actually update in your emulator almost instantaneously. So if I come down here to the theme data widget and I change the primary swatch to say colors green and I save it, you'll see that almost instantaneously the emulator will update to show this change. Even more impressive is the fact that if I add state say to the counter and I change the color to say red, again changing the theme data, the state does not reset when we actually change this theme data color. 
All of this is made possible by the JIT compiler inside of Dart. JIT just stands for just in time. And Dart also has another compiler called the ahead of time compiler or the AOT compiler. When you're developing on your machine, the JIT compiler will be compiling the code as it needs to. So when you make a change to your application, it finds the code that's different and it just updates that piece of the code. However, when you deploy your application to production, Flutter uses the ahead of time compiler. And what this means for us developers is that we can develop and recompile the code rather quickly in development, but we don't have to sacrifice non-native performance in production. We'll talk more about hot reloading and the compilers in a later tutorial, but I just wanted to make you guys aware of this. Now let's go ahead and generate our Flutter application. From the command line, you can go ahead and type flutter create counterexample. And when you execute this command, it will go ahead and create a new application called counterexample in a directory called counter underscore example. If you're in IntelliJ or Android Studio, you may also generate your project just using the menus. I believe you just go to File, New Project, and then you can select Dart or Flutter, and then that will generate the project for you. If you're in Visual Studio Code, you can open up the command palette by hitting Control shift p on Windows, and then you can click Flutter New Project. Then you can type in the name of the project. In this case, I'm just going to call it Example Counter. Then once you hit enter, it will ask you where you want the directory for the project to be created. And then afterwards, it will generate your project for you. Once the project has been generated, you should note the directory structure. In the root of our project folder, we have a bunch of folders and a pubspec YAML file. The pubspec YAML file is a file that we use to define metadata about our project. We'll talk more about this pubspec YAML format later, but in general, this is just a file that contains a bunch of key value pairs. In this file, we can define the name and description of our project. We can define the version of our project. We can also define the environment that we're using. And this is the version of Dart that this project is compatible with. And we can also define things like the dependencies for this project, as well as the dev dependencies for this project, should we want to bring in any third party libraries and stuff like that. Now, outside of the pubspec YAML file, there are also a bunch of folders in our directory. We have an Android folder and we have an iOS folder. We'll talk a bit more about these folder later, but for now, you really just need to know that these folders contain the information that's required to deploy this application onto their respective platforms. In the future, there will also be a web folder in here, which will be used primarily for the web platform target. We've also got this test folder, and this is where you would want to write any tests for your Dart code should you want to do test-driven development. Again, we will talk more about this folder in a later video. And then finally, we have our lib folder, and inside of our lib folder, we have this main.dart file. You'll most likely spend 99% of your time in this folder when you're writing a Flutter application. Inside of the main.dart file, we've got the majority of the code that makes up our counter application. At the top, you can see that we're actually importing a library called Flutter Material. Flutter Material contains all of the base widgets and then the material design themed widgets that exist inside of the Flutter framework. There's also a Flutter Cupertino library, which contains iOS styled widgets. For the most part for this series though, we'll be talking about the material library. Speaking of widgets, the basic building blocks of any Flutter application are called widgets. Flutter is a declarative UI toolkit and widgets are the means by which you declare your UI elements. Almost everything in Flutter is a widget and widgets are just immutable Dart classes that are able to describe a part of the user interface or a view. These widgets are the blueprints which are used to generate your UI elements and they are used for everything from layout and structure to styling and position and even animations. All of these widgets can be composed together to produce more complex widgets, and there are many pre-built widgets in the Flutter framework, which make it easy for us to build robust and complex applications. From a very high level, a Flutter application is just a tree structure, which is made up of these widgets. 
and this is referred to as the widget tree of your application. The widget tree is an important concept for many reasons, and we'll see this idea more and more as we move through this series. For now, let's just look at this project and its associated widget tree. So below the import, we've got our main function, which is the main entry point of our application. This is where the execution of our Dart code starts. In this case, the main function is a single line function, which calls to a top level Flutter function called runApp. RunApp takes a widget as an argument, and it then defines that widget as the root widget for the widget tree of the application. In our case, it's our MyApp custom widget class, which is a stateless widget. Notice that MyApp extends the stateless widget class type, which defines this class as a stateless widget type. All widgets in Flutter are either one of three different types. They can either be a stateless widget, a stateful widget, or an inherited widget. In this video, we will be mainly focusing on stateless and stateful widgets, but inherited widgets are also pretty important. Now, since my app extends stateless widget, the stateless widget class is referred to as the superclass of the my app class. Notice we have this override annotation above the build method. The annotation is essentially just telling Dart that we want to use this implementation of the build method instead of the implementation of the superclass. So the build method that we defined here is overriding the method that's inside of the stateless widget class. Every widget has a build method which returns another widget, and this is where you compose widgets to make your application. There's a widget here called material app which is being returned from the build method. This material app widget wraps the entire application and it passes a bunch of material design specific functionality down the widget tree to all of the other widgets. Widgets are classes and of course classes have constructors. So the material app widget has a bunch of optional and named parameters that we can set up. Specifically, we're setting up the title, the theme, and the home parameters of this MyApp widget. And we're putting in a string, a theme data widget, and then a basic widget type respectively. Now, if you go ahead and you hover your mouse above the widget name, for instance, I'm hovering above the material app widget name, you can actually see the various different parameters that go into the constructor. And if you scroll down to the bottom, you can see a nice little description of the widget if you want to as well. This is what the widget tree for this specific application is going to look like. At the top we have our root widget, which is our my app widget. This then builds the material app widget, which then branches into a theme data configuration widget and another custom widget called my homepage. Now the my homepage widget is actually a stateful widget. And as a result, it's associated with a state class called my homepage state. Inside of the my homepage stateless widget, we have a scaffold widget, which builds out into three different widgets. So we have an app bar, which has a text widget inside of it. Then we have a center, which has a column. And in the column, we have two other widgets, two text widgets, that is. And then we also have what's called a floating action button, which has an icon inside of it. This maps pretty well to our application. So the scaffold contains the app bar, which is this blue bar at the top. And inside of the app bar, we have our text widget, which is the title here. Then we have our center, which is this entire white space here, which has a column in it with the two text widgets, which are these two pieces of text. And then finally, we have our floating action button, which is this round button here with the icon inside of it. And if we click the floating action button, you can see that it actually changes this text widget with the value of our counter inside of it. The primary difference between stateless and stateful widgets can be sort of inferred from their names. A stateless widget is a sort of dumb widget in that it has no ability to update itself based on its own configuration or the data that it's displaying. Also, the stateless widget is destroyed entirely when it's removed from the widget tree. The main implication here is that you do not want a stateless widget to be responsible for any of the data in your application. A stateful widget, on the other hand, has internal state and can manage that state. And all stateful widgets actually have a corresponding state object associated with them. If we look at the code of our My Homepage stateful widget, 
you can see that it's actually made up of two different classes. This top class inherits from the stateful widget class and it overrides a required method called create state. Create state builds out the actual state class, in this case our my homepage state, and this state class is then associated with the my homepage state stateful widget. The state class inherits from the flutter state object and it also contains a parameterized literal of the original stateful widget type. So you can see here that my homepage state extends state with a type of my homepage inside of it. And this syntax is essentially what couples this state object back to this widget up here. The state class also contains the build method for this stateful widget. So you can think of these two classes as a single entity with the stateful widget class being sort of dumb and immutable like the stateless widget and then the associated state class being mutable and smart. So this part of this class will never change but this part down here actually can update and change. The my homepage widget actually needs to be a stateful widget because it contains the state for the actual counter in this application. In this case, the state is just a single counter variable which sits at the top of the state class. Below the counter, we also have a method which is used to change the state for the counter when the button is pushed by incrementing the counter variable up by one. Notice that the increment counter method contains a call to a method called set state, and this is one of the methods that's actually associated with the state class. This set state method is used by the state object to tell Flutter when it should rebuild the stateful widget. The state object lives inside of the my homepage widget and its children interact and rely on its state. When the button is pressed, it calls to the increment counter method and that method calls set state, which in turn calls back to the build method of the state object, rebuilding and repainting the widgets that have changed. So when I click this plus, you can see that it actually updates the number for the counter. Another very important concept is this build context object, which you'll find in every single build method inside of every widget. Build context is a reference to where the widget is located in the widget tree, and it can be used to get data from widgets that are located further up the tree. If we come down here, for instance, this text widget here, which is the actual counter, and you can see that the text for this text widget is much larger than the text above it. This is using a theme of context method call to inherit data from the theme data widget which is located further up the tree. So this text widget down here in the tree is actually getting data from this theme data up here in the tree. This theme of method call finds the closest theme data parent widget and uses the data inside of it to style whatever widget we're calling it on. The build context can also be used to insert widgets into the tree at the current position as well as display widget from a different part of the tree. Widgets, state, and context are the three main cornerstones of developing applications with Flutter. And so let's use them all to enhance this counter application and make it so that we can reset the counter and decrement the counter. So first let's create a button that will allow us to decrement the counter. To accomplish this, we're going to need to create a button and we're gonna to need to create a method that that button will call to change the counter variable. The method itself will also need to call set state like the increment counter method. That way the widget rebuilds itself when the counter changes. We can just follow the pattern of the increment counter method and the increment counter button that exists down here. So here I've created a decrement counter function. And of course, inside of the set state call, we're just taking the counter and we're subtracting one from it by using minus minus. Let's also create a reset counter method. Again, this will call set state. So we just call set state and then inside of the lambda, which is inside of the set state call, we just take the counter variable and we set it equal to zero. So what we want to do is add some buttons to our application so that we can interface with these two methods. And the way that I want to do it is just to add new buttons to the screen here 
and then change this button so that it will reset the counter. So first let's change the floating action button, which is that round button here, so that it actually resets our counter. We can change the on pressed parameter to take in the reset counter method. Then we can change the tool tip to say reset counter. And we can also change the icon, which is the child of this floating action button, to be an icon of refresh. So it's just this circle with an arrow on it. And now if I save our application and I click the button, you can see that it resets the counter back to zero. Inside of the build function of our My Homepage State widget, we have this column widget. The column widget is an interesting widget because it's essentially just a layout widget, but it allows us to put multiple widgets inside of it. Along with the column, we also have a row widget. And the row widget, again, allows us to put multiple widgets inside of it. The main difference between column and row is that column will be vertical, and then the row will be horizontal. If we come down below our text widgets, we can insert this row, and then in the row, we can insert two raised button widgets, one to increment the counter, and then the other one to decrement the counter. And notice that for each of these raised buttons, we're adding a child, which is a text widget in this case. So this will appear on the button. And then we have an on pressed property, which we're setting to either increment counter or decrement counter. So if we look at our application now, you can see we now have these two buttons. One of them will increment the counter by one, and then the other one will decrement the counter by one. But also notice that the buttons are off center horizontally. So we need to align them so that they sit in the center of the screen. We can find a clue about how to do this by looking at the column implementation. The column has three children inside of it, the two text widgets and the row. And it has this property here called main axis alignment. And it's being set to main axis alignment center. If we look at our app, you can see that the two text widgets and the buttons are actually centered in the middle of the screen vertically. And so if we apply this main axis alignment to the row, it should then center these two raised buttons in the row horizontally. And that's exactly what happens. So you can see now these two buttons sit in the middle of our screen horizontally. Let's also go ahead and add some color to these buttons so that they look rather nice. And these are all material based colors. So they're all based on the material design specification. So now we have a green and a red button. And then we also have our blue floating action button down at the bottom. In a later video, we'll go into more detail about the rendering engine and the layout system for Flutter. But for now, just keep in mind that because the column is vertical, its quote unquote main axis is vertical. And then because the row is horizontal, its main axis is also horizontal. The cross axis in the case of the column is horizontal. And then the cross axis in the case of the row is vertical. All right, guys. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, feel free to like and subscribe. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them in the box below. And if you dislike this video, then by all means, downvote it as much as you like. If you want to catch any of the other Intro to Flutter videos that I release, feel free to click that notification bell, and that will be the best way to find the videos as soon as they get released by me. Have a good night, guys.